There we go. Okay, so today's slides, philosophy style lecture today, let's talk about freedom of speech, communication, and open source software, which is exciting. So uh, I guess let's just start with the first idea. Let's go and talk about freedom of speech on the internet, because it's a virtual place. Do all of our laws apply? Let's, let's see. I'll try and answer this question. Does our right to freedom of speech, which we have in this country at least, does that apply to the internet? So, good question to, to ask and wonder about. Let's let's see the answer. Uh, it's a pretty easy answer. The, the answer is kind of yes, more or less. Yes, you do have uh, freedom of speech on the internet as well as you do, of course, in your day-to-day -day physical human existence life. All right. There have been some laws that have been passed and uh, eventually struck down sometimes by uh, Congress people who usually wanted to allow some kind of censorship, like don't let this thing happen, don't let people see this thing, and usually their argument for those kinds of censorship laws are like, we don't want kids to see it, we don't want kids to see this bad thing on the internet, so let's make sure that nobody can see it. That's the idea, so that's why, uh, that's, that's the main justification for a lot of censorship laws these days, and uh, some, but not all of them, have been thrown out in court, but uh, in general, your freedom of speech is more or less protected. Uh, also, anonymity, you remaining anonymous on the internet, that is also generally protected, and we'll talk about some history behind that. So, yeah, that's the, the quick answer. Let's go and explore it a bit further, though. Let's go into censorship. So, I'll try and answer the question, like, what would somebody want to censor? Like, what is the equivalent of, like, a banning a book on the internet? Like, banning a web page? Banning an entire site? Kind of. So, uh, the most common thing that governments want to censor are search results a lot of the time because that's where you get your information as a user, right? You're going to be like, I want to know about this thing, hit enter on Google, and if Google doesn't show you that thing, then you don't have the information, right? So that's where you'd want to go, like make Google not have the information that uh, we don't want you to see. So censoring search results is a very common thing to want to do, and then that won't let the users get to where they want to go. So China, for example, uh, there's not the greatest relation between us and China, of course, so they've banned a lot of Western sites like Facebook, Wikipedia, and Google. If you were to go to China right now, you would need to use a VPN, if you know what that is, to get to these websites. It is not accessible, all right? Uh, Google had a presence in China. There was a Google.cn, and it followed Chinese law up until 2010 when they got rid of that website. Uh, and... What they did was they, they responded to any uh, Chinese takedown requests. Like, so if the Chinese government did not want this particular web page appearing in a search result, Google.cn uh, followed through with that, and they took away that search result from uh, that particular version of Google. So they complied with Chinese law up until 2010 when they got rid of that, and I think they went to Google.hk only, which is stood for Hong Kong, and now there's some issues with Hong Kong, so I don't even know if that one exists anymore. But, uh, yeah. Their justification was, uh, for that, some access is better than no access. Maybe some of those things that uh, users might search for have not yet been banned by the Chinese government, and so let's let them access it on our website. So, uh, but the, the idea was, like, let's just spell out anything. This was operating inside of that country, so anything that the country wanted taken down got taken down. Wanted taken down... You can imagine this might go on in the U.S. as well, and we don't know too much about it. So, uh, that's the idea. And then, of course, the U.S. is big on uh, griping about TikTok these days, because that's uh, made by a Chinese company, and so there's a lot of Congress people who are always complaining about TikTok and saying we should probably ban that. Like, uh, federal contractors, for example, I read in the news, are not allowed to have TikTok on their government-supplied phone, for example, because of... Uh, potential issues there. So yeah, google.cn turned into google.hk, and I don't even know if that one's around anymore. I'll have to look into it. So yeah, that is censoring uh, search results. Search results, and therefore the websites that you would click on if the search result was actually there. So that's a very common thing to want to do uh, in censorship land. Any questions, comments about that idea? That's a great way to limit the access of people in a country. 
All right. Uh, you could take a more heavy-handed approach as well. If you don't like just anything going on on the Internet, you can just shut down the Internet if you would like. That's possible. Some countries have shut down the Internet in response to, like, protests going on, just civil unrest. So, uh, and the reason for this is several countries are the sole Internet service provider for everyone in their country. Some governments, like, give the Internet to their people. And so there is no concept, like, of separate Internet companies. Like, we have Comcast, we have uh, Google Fiber or whatever. That does not exist in some countries. The government owns the, the infrastructure. So they have access, a little bit less free, to infrastructure. And, of course, they can take things down. They can cut a cord, right, because they have access to all of it. And so here are just some examples from the textbook. If you bought it, maybe you've read about it. So uh, back in 2011, there was, uh, you know, like the Arab Spring, the, Egy the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, the government of Egypt shut down the Internet. Just nobody was allowed to connect to the Internet at all because that's what the protesters were using to talk to each other and to organize with. Does that make sense? So Egypt was like, all right, let's just shut it off. Now they're going to have trouble organizing because, of course, that was in response to the government and against the government, uh, those protests. So that is problematic, but that's something a country can do. Uh, then back in 2016, there was a coup in Turkey, if you remember that. And uh, what the people were doing again was they were using social media to organize people, as, as people do, using social media. to organize themselves and figure out when the next protest was going to be and where it was going to be. So Turkey blocked a lot of social media websites like Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for a short amount of time to hopefully quell the, the unrest. And that's the idea. And so you could shut down the internet if you would like, if you have that kind of power as a government. Any questions, comments about that? Remember these stories, maybe? It's been a while. But that is totally allowable if you own that kind of infrastructure, which is no fun, but it is a possibility. And so that's, that's what I wanted to say about censorship. Uh, let's also talk about a very similar concept called anonymity, which is hard for me to say. So what, what is this all about? I would like to remain anonymous on the Internet. I don't want to have to make a web, an account on every website. Uh, how is that protect protected? Like, should people even be allowed to be anonymous on the internet? Because I think you can imagine that anonymity, in addition to like being good pro, uh, we don't want people to spy on us. It could also there's a flip side to it where like if you are anonymous on the internet, uh, nobody can trace back what you're saying and maybe you're saying bad things. So there's a there's two sides to every coin, of course. Let's talk about some examples of wanting to be anonymous. So here is a fun idea. This is uh, something that South Korea did. So they wanted, uh, if you go to Google Maps, you can, of course, scroll all over the Earth and click on the satellite view, click on the map view. I'm sure we've all done that. Uh, South Korea, they wanted their presidential house and all their power plants and all of their military installations, they wanted those taken off of Google Maps for safety purposes because uh, South Korea is very close to North Korea. They are not in the best of relationships right now. And so they thought that, I mean, North Korea has access to the internet. They could very easily figure out exact locations of places if they just used a free service like Google Maps. And so, uh, yeah, Google, here's the presidential house. It's called the Blue House in uh, South Korea. And that is not on the normal map view, but I guess it is on the, uh, the satellite view. You can't really get rid of that. But they wanted it gone for safety reasons. Is that allowable? Should large places like that be allowed to be taken off? Power plants as well, so that like your enemy cannot know the GPS coordinates of it, for example. Is that a good idea? Uh, so I guess... When we have an ethical question like this, and of course this is an ethical question, we, we're going to ask our boys, like, what would Kant say to this? What would Mill say to this? Like, 
like, should people be allowed to remain private, anonymous, off be allowed to hide our, uh, our information? And I think Kant would say, yeah, uh, he is always pro-individual rights, don't use people as a means to an end. I shouldn't always have to alert everyone in the world to my location, so Kant would probably say, yeah, it's okay to hide yourself. And that was his reasoning. It's okay to hide yourself. Well, that kind of makes sense. That's what he would want. And then Mill, who is a utilitarian, you might, uh, you're, you're forced to do a little bit extra work. There's no just cut and dried answer. It's, all right, how are you weighing these, this, these different outcomes? What is the utility of saying yes versus saying no? Like maybe you could argue that Mill would say, yes, anonymity is great because uh, that offers more protection for people. Like the president is more protected if we take their house off of Google Maps, for example. And maybe... Uh, because a lot of people rely on the president in South Korea, maybe that's uh, going to win out in terms of utility. But you could also say no, like this is not a good idea, and you would you could find some firepower there as well. Like this is this should be public information. I think if you want to write a letter to to the president here, you know their address. It shouldn't be very uh, hard. It should not be a secret where all these things are, because like people might want to go there to visit on their holidays, for example. So. That is uh, a potential argument against this kind of anonymity. Like, and also, if you had anonymity on the internet, then you can't trace bad things back to somebody who said a bad thing. Maybe you'd want to do that. Okay. So uh, I think Kant would be like, yeah, an anonymity, please, let's have it. But Mill would probably be a little wishy-washy if you argue either way. Okay. Any questions about that? Good with it. It's an interesting little idea, I think. Uh, yeah, let's keep on trucking. I think we're doing okay. Just have a bunch of examples today, really. So, if we like rewind back to the start of the history of this country, uh, anonymity was actually really protected even from the beginnings of uh, this country before it existed in America. So, if you've watched Hamilton, for example, or taken a social studies class, you've probably read about the Federalist Papers, right? So. Uh, the Federalist Papers were written by three different people, three different founding fathers, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. And those Federalist Papers, which were like arguing for the Constitution or whatever it was, uh, they were published anonymously. They were published anonymously. They did not, these people did not attach their names to them. And actually, it's still an open question to this day which some, whether some of the papers were written by like Hamilton or Madison or Jay. You have to do some weird anal textual analysis to, to get a good guess. So, yeah, even the Federalist Papers, these things that we're arguing for, some basic thing that we have now today in our country, they were published anonymously. And the reason those three guys did it that way is because, one, they were very well known, and they didn't want to attach their name to the idea because that would have made the idea more popular. Uh, they wanted to just get the idea out without a name attached so that people would argue for the merits of it versus... The merits of like not having it. They wanted the idea to stand to stand front and center and not attach a name to it, so that people could think for themselves. And that was a big deal at the time. Uh, and then also, it was just very. Uh, it was a custom to write with a pen name. Like you don't attach your name to to your writing so that nobody can trace it to you. That was just a common thing that people did back then. Uh, and so anonymity has been protected and even encouraged, at least in America, for. So ever since it became a thing, ever since it existed. So that's kind of cool. Uh, also, just in terms of pen names and things, like anonymity was also kind of required for women back in the day if they were going to be authors. If you've read, like, Jane Eyre, for example, in a high school English class like I did, you will have learned that uh, the author did not put her real name on the book when she published it. Because she used a man's sounding name. Uh, that was because it was frowned upon for women to go and write books back then. And so a lot of people use pseudonyms. Uh, some of them were, of course, forced. So, yeah, that's the Federalist Paper. So anonymity, it's been protected since the, the beginnings of this country. And so that's cool. And so that's nice. It's a good thing to have. Any questions, ideas about that? Because I want to show you something interesting, uh, us being citizens of California. So, uh, yeah. Here's a fun example of anonymity, and maybe it's not a good thing. I'll, I'll force you to think about it. So 
some very interesting things, some very interesting facts about people, private citizens, are available publicly, which is fun. Uh, if you go to this place, this website is called californiabirthindex.org. Uh, if you go there, there is a search feature. Is it going to load? There it goes. If you go here, there is a search feature, and uh, all the birth records of people born in California from 1905 to 1995 are on this website publicly available. It's public domain to do this kind of thing. And so uh, I'm on here. My sister's on here. My mom's on here. My grandma's on here. It's ridiculous. Uh, it's so interesting how this is all public domain. So for example, let's look up somebody, hopefully we all know, I'm wearing her shirt today just because it's a fun idea. So I love Phoebe Bridgers and she was born in California. So let's look her up. Click enter. There's apparently only one of them, but uh, here she is. There's her middle name. She was born on this date. She was born in Orange County. Interesting. Her father's last name, of course, Bridgers, and her mother's maiden name is Gandola. And so this is information that, is, that exists on the internet for anybody to look at. Look up your parent if they, they were born in California, for example. They're on here. And it will click if you have multiple, like, aunts and uncles, for example, you'll scroll down scroll down, and be able to see like, oh, maybe possible relations and you can click on them too. So it's really interesting. I encourage you to try it, but this is public information for everybody to see. And so um, I know on her Wikipedia page, Phoebe Bridgers like had her mom's name, but it didn't have her mom's maiden name a long time ago. Maybe that was information she didn't want to give out, but it's on here and publicly available for anybody to see. I think at the very beginnings of her career, like I didn't know her mom's maiden name. It was not on Wikipedia, but it was on this webpage. I think it's on there now, though. Uh, so that kind of information, it's available for everybody to see. And you know, she has a brother, but he was born in like not 95, a bit later. So that's outside of this record realm. So yeah, that's a fun little example. Any questions about that? The question for, for you that I have is, is this okay? Is this kind of information publicly available with like your birthday, place of birth, mother's maiden name, all these things? Like a lot of people, like when they're making a an account on some website, they use as a like a security challenge question their mother's maiden name. And here it is publicly available for everybody to see. Interesting. Is that allowed? Any questions, comments about that? Have we seen this website before? So yeah, look up your parents if uh, you're a native California. It's fun to think about. Um, so yeah, this this is a question for you to ponder. Like, is this an okay thing to have? Is this too much information being linked, or is that uh, is that just fine? Who knows? It's up to you to think about. Uh, all right, my next question or my next idea is: This is California birth index. There is another website that is a Swedish website that is potentially worse, potentially more problematic. It's called uh, hitta.se, so that just means like find. So I assume. There we go. And so this is a website, it's called hitta.se, and like, all right, sure, give me all the, co the cookies. It's in Swedish, of course, because it's a Swedish website, but what it is, it's like California index, but it has a ton more information about people. I don't know anybody who is Swedish. Uh, maybe if you know like a, a famous actor's name, we can look them up. But uh, let's look up like the most common name so that we can get a lot of results. So uh, Lars Anderson apparently is Swedish, uh, is like Sweden's equivalent of the name John Smith, like the most common name that anybody has. So Lars Anderson is Sweden's John Smith. Let's look up all the Larses that exist on this website. So, click enter, and it's like, I have found 8,260 Lars Andersons, of course, because there's a ton of them, but uh, look at them all. You can scroll down, find them, Lars Anderson, and let me just click on one of them. I don't know. Maybe the first one. Not only do you have his address, you have it on a map, uh, you know where he was born, 
the city he was born in. There's a telephone number for Lars. Missing two digits, but you can probably figure that out pretty quickly by trying them all if you really wanted them. I know a little bit of Swedish, so this is, this is helpful for this, for this occasion. Uh, he lives together with someone named this. So maybe that's his wife. Lives at the same address. His birthday was February 12th. And apparently in Sweden, uh, you have like a name day as well as a birthday. Like maybe that's the, the patron saint his name was came after. I don't know. That's the 10th of August. And um, his house is valued at 710,000 kroners, whatever that is. That's their currency there. So you have his phone number. You have... Lars's address, you know who he's living with, got his birthday, his age, that's a little worse than California birth index, yeah, that's crazy, that's wild, so, uh, yeah, is that okay, is the question, should this kind of information be publicly available, should it be able to be traced back to you, because, I mean, wouldn't it be very easy to steal someone's identity like this, I don't know, that's my question. So uh, with that in mind, I now have a question for you. So those are your two websites. Uh, I would like you to think about this. Let's have a little debate. So get together with the people next to you and please go to the written ice page. Also sign in. I'll stop that. It's working. But please go to the written ice page and I'll clear it out for us. But yeah, just pick a, pick a leader of your group and have them write a post, remember, to get your group number, and I'm going to do this based on group numbers as usual. To get a group number, you're just going to, as a group, somebody clicks the submit button, and that will populate the question marks with a real number. And so here's your debate question. Should people be allowed to remain anonymous on the internet? All right? And I want you to write down two good arguments for your stance that I'm going to give you here. So if you're an even group, I would like you to write two good arguments saying that, yes, we like anonymity. Anonymity. Anonymity is good. Anonymity is good. So if you're an even group, please uh, pick that stance. If you're an odd group, I'd like you to, to argue to come up with two good arguments for the opposite. Anonymity is bad. All right, come up with two good reasons why in either case. Any questions about the question before I let you talk to each other for a little while and get down your answers? All right, yes. So have a little debate amongst yourselves and uh, write down some good arguments, and then we'll come back and talk about them. Maybe like four minutes, I think. Four or five minutes.
about one more minute to get your two good arguments in, please. All right, please finish up that thought, click submit, and let's take a look at what we're thinking. Okay. So if you're even, you said anonymity is a good thing, we should have it. If you're odd, you said it was a bad thing, we should not have it. So let's get started. Remember to click submit. There's a few groups still working, I think. So, all right. Group 47, who was an odd group, said it was bad. Bad for protection of citizens because it provides ways to hide information. Good, yeah, and even hide potential threats. Yeah, you want bad people to be out in the open and to know who they are. Anonymous user posting threatening remarks. It'd be very hard to find that person and like take them into custody and make sure they don't hurt anybody. That's exactly right. So that's a great, great argument there. Uh, and again, exploited by criminals. So that's that is one of the most common arguments against uh, anonymity. So that's, that's pretty common. And yeah, group fifty, an even group, said anonymity is good. How, how come? There are benefits to sharing ideas without your name attached. Very good. Yeah. Just think about the idea in terms of the idea, not in terms of who wrote it, even if they're famous. Yeah. Very good. Uh, person can use the internet as an outlet to express themselves without it being linked back to their normal lives. So they may want to like separate your online life with your personal life. There are reasons for that, of course. Great ideas. Yeah. Any other comments? Thoughts about this? Maybe some of us are shy. All right. So yeah, good thoughts. Thank you for thank you to the, the three groups who who posted something. I'll force you guys to do some more of this next time. So yeah, that is the end of this little subsection on anonymity. Are we good to to keep to keep going to a different topic? All right, let's see here. Where are we going next? So yeah, the next topic that I have is the open source movement. And so you have interacted with a lot of open source software and maybe you haven't known it. So let's let's talk about that. So open source, if you've never heard that term before, it just means like uh, when, when it says source, it means source code. So like the lines of computer code that are written to make your program that's available for everybody to see, everybody to change perhaps. That's what open source software means. It's available for anybody to access and change without having to pay for it, right? And so, yeah, I'll try and answer this question. What, what can I do if I don't trust the software that I run and I also don't want to pay for it? Well, I have good news for you, my friend. Open source software. That is the way to go. So I guess before we get there, let me, let me tell you the opposite. The opposite of open source is closed source. So, for example, I'm using PowerPoint right now. It's written by Microsoft as part of Microsoft Office. Microsoft Office, and of course Microsoft sells Microsoft Office to schools and companies and things, and uh, they don't want to give that away for free. They make their money with it. Microsoft Office is closed source, we say. 
the source code to it is not freely available. I have a a program that I can run. Like it's just a black box to me though. It's been it's been made by Microsoft. Like it's called Power pnt.exe or something. And I can run it, of course, but I can't really like take this apart very easily and understand how it was built. I can't get the source code out of this pre-made executable program. That's, that's what the opposite is. Uh, but there are, all, there are open source alternatives, and that is what I want to talk to you about now. So uh, most programming languages are open source, which is fun to think about. Uh, Scratch, for example, and Python, which we're about to learn, they're both open source software. The Scratch uh, editor that we use, the, the Python uh, interpreter that we're going to download and install eventually, those are both pieces of open source software. So they are available for all of us, anybody in the world, to use for free. Just download it from their website. It's all there for you. And also, a one of the, the features of open source is that all the source code that people use to write Scratch or to write Python is available if you would like to either look at it to make sure that you trust it or to build on top of it if you'd like to, if you have some idea that uh, you want to take the language further somewhere that it's not currently going. You have that ability. And at the same time, there's, there's a lot of uh, ideas about licenses. With every open source software comes an open source software license. It tells you what you can do. It's like a legal document. It tells you what you can do with this open source code. And so like Scratch, it has a license if you look at it. It's like a GPL2 license. It's like it tells you exactly what you can do, exactly what you're not allowed to do. Like you can't sue this pe the makers of Scratch if your program blows up or something because they gave it to you for free. Same with Python. And so there's always like a different kind of license for pieces of code. And Python has gone through a couple different licenses, I think, if I'm reading that right. But yeah, that is open source software. A lot of programming languages, which are the things you use to build your software, they are open source. An interesting fact. Uh, Linux, also, if you've heard of that, that is an open source operating system. And maybe you haven't heard the term operating system defined for you before, so let me define that for you now. Uh, Windows is an operating system, Mac OS is an operating system, Linux is also an operating system. Uh, all an operating system is, is it's a, it's a program, but it's a very important one. It's a program that runs your other programs. Like, it's in charge of the entire computer once it gets turned on and started. It's a program that runs programs. So that's how I'll define operating system. Okay? And so, for example, like Windows, I'm running Windows on this laptop. The school gave me, and uh, Windows, the operating system, is make, taking care that all of these um, processes that are running on my computer right now, all these little things, they're all getting a, their fair share of the of the CPU, uh, whatever I want to, to be doing. They all get their, they all are taking turns, and Windows is making sure that they're all sharing nicely with each other. Because like there's only like four cores in the CPU and there's a ton of programs running. There's way more than four. That's the idea. That's what an operating system is all about. And so what it does is, of course, it runs your programs and starts them. It also makes sure that they talk nicely with each other and share things. Like they have to share your memory, right? So the operating system manages your memory. Make sure nobody uses too much. Uh, it manages your files. So if a program wants to save a file, like I save my PowerPoint, it has to go through the operating system and be like, hey, operating system, hey, Windows, pretty please, can I save this file now at this place? So so on and so forth. That's the idea. Uh, Linux is an open source operating system. Technically, it's a kernel, uh, which is slightly different, but let's just pretend it's an operating system. Uh, Linux is very popular in that, well, it's open source. It's available for anybody to use for free. It's wonderful, and it's like if you have an Android phone, you're running Linux on that phone. It drives the cost down a bit, which is nice. Uh, and pretty much every single website you go to these days, like our class website, for example, uh, I have a Linux server serving that to you right now. That's the idea. So every website pretty much these days that you connect to on the internet is serving you its content via a Linux server because like, just imagine you have a giant data center with a bunch of servers inside of it owned by uh, Canvas or something, and they need to install an operating system on every 
every one of those servers, and they don't want to pay for Microsoft Windows licenses for each of them. Linux is the way to go. It's free, and it does the same stuff. So that's what Linux is all about. Any questions about uh, these first few slides on open source software? I have one last. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm happy to help you in office hours. Yeah. I would recommend uh, Ubuntu as the way to start. That's one of the most uh, user-friendly ones. And that is what our class server is running, for example. And when I force my students in CSI 40 and onwards to connect to. There are plenty of options. Uh, Any other questions? All right. Uh, the last piece of open source software that I want to talk to you about is just a big conglomeration of different pieces of open source software. It's, it's a corporation or a company called GNU. It's not GNU, you just pronounce it, even though it's an acronym. It's called GNU, and it stands for, it's a recursive acronym, it's funny. Uh, GNU stands for, GNU is not Unix, which is just a joke. But uh, their, uh, their mascot is like a wildebeest because the word GNU, you really you pronounce it like this, if you know Spanish. It's like there's an enya, so it's GNU. That's the name of the, the wildebeest. It's another name for wildebeest, but they're going to say GNU instead with a hard G. And these people, led by Richard Stallman, who is like a very, very popular person in the open source software arena, so like one of the first people to argue for it, uh, the GNU project, led by this guy named Richard Stallman, is just a big collection of different pieces of free software, and together it gives you a starting point with which you can have a useful operating system. So it's used to power Linux. Like Linux is the kernel, we say, which like manages the memory and the files, but uh, the GNU software that runs on top of that like gives you the ability to actually do useful well, take some explaining. Maybe CSI 40 is where you'd have to go and look if that idea interests you. But yeah, the, the technical term then is not just Linux by itself. It's GNU slash Linux. That's the idea. So yeah, I will force you to get acquainted with this stuff in CSI 40 or any other class that you take from me that's not this one. Uh, yeah, founded by Richard Stallman back in the day. And Richard Stallman has some very, very uh, non-standard beliefs but it's good that he has them because he's he's really fighting for us. He believes that all programs should be free, first of all. Not, like Microsoft should not be allowed to sell Microsoft Office. Like he believes that every single program written should be free and should have its source code available. And he, he legitimately follows his rules to the T. He only runs Linux with GNU software. It's a very, very popular man. Potentially controversial. Uh, so yeah, that is open source in a nutshell. Uh, you can thank a lot of people for uh, the websites you go to these days. Linux and GNU, they're powering each of them, most likely. All right. I have one last subsection for today. I think we're, we're good to go. So yeah, this is intellectual property again. Uh, there's plenty more to talk about, so let's, let's go there. All right. So last time talking about like piracy and stuff like this is it's a it's a touchy subject there's a lot of quarter cases like where you can do this but you can't do that uh let me show you a few more just just highlights some pieces of information that will help you uh just get your mind rolling thinking about the things i want you to think about so yeah let's talk about fair use first that is a interesting and useful topic so uh it just so happens that like you have you are allowed to read copyrighted things like books and textbooks and things. You're allowed to reuse them in very predefined specific ways, which is really cool. That's a very utili utilitarian take that the, the U.S. gave us there. And um, here are the rules of fair use. You're allowed to reuse a copyrighted work in the U.S. as long as you don't reuse too much of it, you don't copy too much, uh, and also your use of it, your reuse of it, should not, like, hinder that the creator of that original content that you're reusing. Not keep them from making more money off of that content. Like, don't try and sell it again. Uh, as long as you stick to those ideas, it's you're allowed to reuse things. And let me let me give you some examples of that. 
So, for example, if I really wanted you guys to read a chapter of a textbook, I am allowed to give, I'm allowed to photocopy a copy of a single chapter for each student in this class. That is fair use. So excerpts, excerpts of like a book, uh, I can reproduce that for students. So I can go and photocopy you guys a chapter of a book that I really want you guys to read, and that is totally fine. That's fair use. But uh, I can't copy the entire book. I can't give you a copy of the entire book because that's that is infringing on the author's right. Like I should make you buy it at that point. Okay. So maybe you, have you ever had a, a teacher like give you guys a like a, a stapled together copy of a, like a chapter of a book or just sections of some book? They are totally allowed to do that. They're not gonna, you don't have to be forced to buy that one chapter. Not a big deal. Um, also, you're allowed to reproduce in a way in a place that a lot of people here are allowed to reproduce a small amount of music. Maybe I should say short amount of music. So, for example, like, I don't know if we, you've experienced this, maybe it's been too long, but, like, before we had streaming services, you had to buy a bunch of individual songs, like, on the iTunes store or something, and if you double-click on the song, it would give you, like, a 30-second preview of that song, even though you haven't bought it yet. That's fair use of that song. And so that's also why on YouTube, if you have a channel, you're not going to get a copyright strike unless you've played that song for, like, a long time. Because then people can, like, take it from your music, take it from your sound, and, like, now they have to copy of that song for themselves. But as long as you have a short amount of it, that's not a problem. That is fair use. So, yeah, maybe you've heard of that before, like, people getting their YouTube channels taken down because much of a song because it was in the background as they were recording or something. As long as it wasn't on for very long, nothing anybody can do about it. Any questions, comments about that? That's fair use. And so, uh, yeah, fair use is in contrast to piracy. Like me giving you a copy of that entire book would have been piracy, but me giving you a chapter is fair use. Yeah, question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Weird. That's, yeah, that's very silly, and I, I have a feeling that that's because there was, like, a disconnect between the, the legal people behind the video game and then the, the actual creators of it. That's a great point, yeah. That's right, and so you'll have to like you'll have to argue your case. It's like guilty until proven innocent. Uh, can, I, can I say an example? Yeah. Uh, recent game released called Hi-Fi Rush. Really, really good. But it contains copyrighted songs. Uh, mm -hmm. The game is, and it's like backing Trump stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like the Trump Tower is really, really cool, but it has so many platforms like YouTube and Twitch will instantly copyright strike it. It's right from the instant ground. Even though that game already has full rights to it, which you were technically. That's funny that you have to do that if you want to stream. That's that's unfortunate, but uh, yeah, it comes back to fair use, I guess. You're not allowed to give that for the world to see. Just the people who bought the game, I guess, have the rights to play it for their own ears. Yeah, these, these are great thoughts. Any others before we move on? I have a game for us to play next. Uh, so the opposite of fair use is piracy. Let's let's play. Is that piracy? So you could just like show me with your thumbs if you think yes it is, no it's not. Do we think that recording a TV show is piracy? Yes, it's piracy. No, it's not. What do we think? What are our thoughts? Is it is it piracy to record a TV show? Uh, is it like, like a personal copy or? That's the right question to ask. Yeah, so let's say it's just for us. I want to look at it later. I want to watch it later. I'm going to work today, and uh, I can't watch the Super Bowl because I'm at work. I'm going to record it for myself. 
Very good. Yeah, so this is not piracy. Assuming it's just for you, this is not piracy, and uh, though places uh, like TV broadcasters, they really wanted it to be piracy. They argued for this being piracy back in the day, uh, right when the first VHS tape recorders, if you have heard of that, maybe you're too, too young, uh, right when those came out. Now you can suddenly program your TV to record a show when you're not there, and you can watch it later. TVs didn't, uh, TV broadcasters did not like that, uh, because that gives you more power as a consumer. And they tried to get that out of the, uh, like, they tried to argue in court that that was not legal, but the courts upheld it. It's legal, and broadcasters hate it. Uh, okay. This is not very common these days because most video games that you buy, they're not available on, like, physical media anymore. But let's pretend, let's go back to the, the days when, like, uh, the GameCube was out. You had a little tiny DVD uh, that had your GameCube game on it. Do you think it's piracy, yes or no, if you copy a GameCube game using, like, a DVD? Again, just for yourself. Yes, no. You didn't buy it. Or you bought this game, right? You didn't buy the TV show. That was just, like, on the internet. Or, like, on the the waves of the... On the radio waves. But the GameCube game you bought, and now you're making a copy of it. Yeah, okay. Again, this is fine. This is another case of fair use. Very good. It is a backup. This is a backup just for yourself, and you are allowed to make a backup just for yourself. That is not a problem. You are totally allowed to copy th a thing that was physical, that was given to you. Same with CDs and stuff like that. All right, what about if you take that copy thing and you give it to your friend to play? Piracy, not piracy. Yeah, so that one, that's when it becomes not legal anymore. It's not your own backup anymore. You gave it to somebody else to play, and they should have bought it. That's no longer fair use. So, again, the idea is, if it's just for you and nobody else is, like, losing money, uh, absolutely fair use. Not a problem. Okay? Um, let's get into a very, very subtle idea that is also fair use. It's called reverse engineering. So, reverse engineering, the, the word, for example, if you've never heard of what reverse engineering is, it's when you take something apart just to see how it's made. So like you, I don't know, you open up your car, you open up your computer that you bought, you open up your game console or something. I'm not sure. Whatever you want, open it up. You can look inside, look at the code if you have a, a way of extracting it. Courts have argued in favor of reverse engineering video game consoles. And where I'm going with this is emulators, if you've heard of those. It's so like emulators exist for pretty much every video game system under the sun, back from the early Nintendo systems all the way to, like, you have Wii emulators these days. So, uh, an emulator is when you convert hardware to software. So you have a program that pretends it's a Wii, and it runs the Wii game for you on your computer. That's the idea, that's what an emulator does. And so courts have ruled that it's okay to reverse engineer video game consoles to create emulators. Totally fine. That is fair use, in fact. One of the most popular uh, emulators these days is called Dolphin. It emulates GameCube and Wii games. Which is fine. Think about it, you just play them on your computer now with some USB joystick. Uh, so, the, the idea there, the reason it's fair use, this was the viewpoint of the courts, uh, the purpose, the reason people were making these emulators is because, one, the hardware wasn't being sold anymore, it wasn't being manufactured anymore, so you couldn't get your hands and people wanted to get their hands on it so that they could make their own, make new games, new creative works that ran on this old hardware. People like to I don't know, make retro games for themselves. That's a very common thing these days. And so the purpose of making the emulator, making a, like a virtual copy of a Wii, that was so that they could make new games. I guess, of course, you have your pirates who just want to play their old, their other games that they stole, but the the main purpose of the emulator writers was to make new things, not to copy the hardware and, like, resell it, because, of course, the hardware was copyrighted and you can't sell it to anybody else. So this is supposed to be given away for free. So that is why it is fair use. You can download an emulator for your favorite video game console 
and you can make a backup of your own game, put it on your computer, and run it on the emulator. Absolute fair use. Not a problem. You're not going to jail for anything. That is not at all piracy, which is fun to think about. So, yeah, that's reverse engineering in a nutshell. Any questions about that? Of course, you can see how piracy could be very easily done based on this, but assuming you own the game, you're allowed to play it on your computer. All right. Uh, yeah, a couple more slides about these topics. They're fun ones. So let's next go to DRM. Maybe you've heard about that before. It stands for, it's an acronym, it stands for Digital Rights Management. And it's just a bunch of weird software written by a bunch of different people under this umbrella that uh, controls the use of something. Controls is controls the use of like an intellectual property that is made in a digital format. So like if you buy a song, maybe there's DRM attached to it. If you buy a video game, maybe there's DRM attached to it. And what DRM does is it's like a little box and it controls whether you have access to something. And so like you open up your video game and essentially you're asking DRM first, hey DRM, please, can I play this game? Uh, can I use this thing? Can I play this game? That's a better way of saying it. Uh, and then the DRM goes and it talks to its server somewhere, maybe. Checks your license key and it's like, yes, I will open it up for you now. Or no, I will keep you from running this because I don't believe that you have the rights to it. Uh, that's fun. That is what DRM is all about. Uh, there are a lot of video games associated with this. Uh, songs back in the day, they had DRM attached to them so that only your account could play the songs, things like that. Uh, the producer of the content, whatever it is, a video game, uh, uh, a song track, can control how you use that thing, right? And, I mean, that's great for the manufacturers, makes keeps piracy uh, at bay, kind of, but there are a lot of issues with DRM as well, because video games, for example, there, there have been video games that have been popular for a very long time, and so people have been playing them for decades. Uh, video games have become, certain ones have become unplayable, because the game is so old that the DRM servers that the game talks to every time you run it, they were taken down because not enough people played the game anymore. But a few hundred people still wanted to play it or something, and now they can't anymore because that DRM black box can't talk to the right server anymore. It can't give you access to play the game and open it up. So that thing that you bought that you thought you'd always be able to use, nope, sorry, you can't use it anymore. Just for a quirk in the way that DRM works. That's kind of no fun. Uh, so that is that. And then, of course, there's also textbooks. Like, maybe you've all had to interact with a virtual textbook before, right? That textbook is associated with your account, and you cannot resell it, right? And maybe it expires either uh, as well. So, yeah, you can't resell a virtual textbook. And DRM is the reason. It's only associated with your account. Maybe we should lobby for that, that ability. Any questions, comments about that idea? Fun, fun little topics to get us thinking. All right, I think I have two more slides. Yeah, that uh, is us at the bottom. So let's, let's next go to patents. Just a bunch of related topics. So software patents, that's a weird idea. Like, I'm sure you've learned about what patents are. Like somebody patented like the, the machine that strips the cotton away from the cotton seed or something like that was a very important early patent in this country. Uh, software patents are a bit different because what is software but something you cannot touch physically? It's just a piece of code. Should you be allowed to patent something that's not like a physical machine? Should you be allowed to patent intangible things, things you can't touch? That's a big question, and people don't agree. So, uh, of course, Richard Stallman, the person behind the GNU project, uh, thinks that the answer is, of course, no, you should never be allowed to do this. But uh, you can think of arguments for and against being able to patent software to make sure that people don't try and make the same version of this software. Like maybe Microsoft patents Microsoft Word, and so nobody can ever make Google Docs. That's, that's a possibility, right? So. That's what software patents is, are all about, and certain pieces of software have been patented. It's not completely against the rules. So there are arguments for and against software patents. I guess the, the easiest one to think of 
an argument for software patents, for having them, is that, well, the software creators, they're trying to make money off of this thing. They, we want them to be paid, right? And if you patent a piece of software, another company can't go come along and make a complete copy of that software, because then they're infringing on the patent, and then they could make, they could be sued, for example. And so that keeps people from stealing ideas and copying software, just an, another company making a copy of your of your video game or something. That is an argument for software patents. But of course, there's other ones against software patents that, that you could come and think about. Uh, because at the end of the day, like, you should not be allowed to patent uh, Google Docs or Microsoft Word, the idea of typing up something and saving a file. That's silly. Any, It's just an idea. Software is just an idea, and anybody should be allowed to recreate that idea, right? As, as long as they don't copy your exact layout or your exact icon so that people don't get confused. That's still against the law. But, like, there are free copies of... Microsoft Word, it's called like OpenOffice or something these days, LibreOffice, and there's open source copies of Photoshop, for example, and Illustrator and things like that. That all exists. So, uh, yeah, software patents uh, are a thing. You can argue for or against them, and yeah, it's, I guess, up to the patent office to approve of it or disprove of it. Any ideas about that? So Apple, Microsoft, for example, you can go and look up in, there's a patent search engine and you'll see all of the things that they've created. Uh, yeah. And then finally, circling back to our idea of fair use, if you're searching for something on Google, you kind of need fair use in that, uh, in that situation because like if I search for something, here's my Google web page opened and I, I click search and I type something in and I click it. It needs to show me a bunch of things, right, with that word in it. Like, it needs to show me a bunch of pages. And in the Google search results, it always shows you, like, some of the contents of that page. So you can be like, oh, yeah, that's the one I wanted. It's got the, the features that I, I'm looking for. It's got the right words next to this word that I searched for, right? You, the, every search engine has to show you those little snippets of what you searched for. And so it has to reproduce portions of that web page even if the, the content there is copyrighted. And so that is another great case for fair use. It's very important to have, otherwise you wouldn't be able to have a search engine. It would be like, here's a link, click on it. I, I promise it has what you're looking for. They wouldn't be allowed to reproduce the stuff there. Google is much better because uh, any search engine, it's you're better off because it's allowed to reproduce a little bit of the page before you click on it so that you can narrow down your options before you go somewhere. That's the idea. So, yeah, search engines, they require fair use. They copy lots of stuff, don't they? Maybe you never thought of it that way. Any questions, comments about any of that stuff? Fun little ideas today. So, yeah. Okay, we did attendance. The last thing I want to talk about is... That was the end of the slides. Let's go to your next essay because... We have one due this week, so let's have another one out. So we do week eight. And it is a 750-word essay. All right, so... I'm zooming the wrong way. Let me... My browser's moving quite slowly. Let me use the key combo instead. All right, so this one's about privacy and encryption. That's why I'm assigning it after these slides. Here's your prompt. Uh, relatively recently, this has come up in the news, uh, if you go and you if you travel internationally, in between airports, uh, you have to get a lot of the time like searched at that new airport or before you get into the international terminal. Like customs officials at the country you go to, right? They're allowed to search your stuff. Customs officials at airports, precisely, have asked travelers in the past to unlock their phones before they let them in the country, so they could read what they had on their phone. They have asked travels travelers to do that, and they have denied them entry if they did not say yes. Right? So I, my question to you is, like, what are your thoughts about this idea of asking travelers to unlock their phones so that the customs officials can read them? Is that a good idea? What are your thoughts? Should it be always allowed? Do you think it's a great idea? Everybody should always be allowed to, or like every customs official should be allowed to ask this and let people uh, unlock their phones for them and deny them entry otherwise? Should it be never allowed? Like, that's a bad idea. It should never be uh, allowed for anybody to use. Like, you should just let people in. 
or should it be allowed in certain cases? Like some, some it's okay, some it's not okay. So pick a stance, one of those most likely, uh, or somewhere in between, and please explain your answer. I want you to talk, of course, about both sides of the argument. Think about what the people who would be arguing against you would say, and try and bash down their argument. That's what makes yours a good one, right? You gotta talk about both sides, prop up your side, bash down the other side. That's what I wanna see. And um, yeah, this will be a 750 word essay in response to this prompt. Uh, I do want two citations. So you must cite two separate sources, at least once for each source in your essay. And uh, like I've said before, you're not allowed to cite Wikipedia. That's not good enough. That's not re that's not research. Instead, you go to the go to the, the citations that Wikipedia has. Read those articles. Cite that thing. That's the idea, right? So this is your prompt, and uh, 750 words about uh, this privacy slash encryption encryption topic. Uh, and I want two citations. Any questions about that? That'll be due week eight, uh, which is which will be the third, March third for most of us. Uh, let's see here, and that is going to be that's going to be a Friday for a reason. And let me talk to you now about the reason. We still have some time, so let's go there. Uh, so normally your essays are not due on a Friday, are they? So let me tell you why. And the reason is your midterm. So we are in week six right now. Well, at least this as well. We are in week six right now, and I have promised that there will be a midterm in this class, just one. It'll be halfway through the class, and it's a 16 week, or 16 weeks of classes, and then a finals week. That's the 17th week, so week eight is about in the middle. So week eight will be when our midterm is, and so I will release now this uh, midterm uh, module on Canvas. Not the actual midterm itself, but just the midterm info page. And so let me talk to you now, finally, that'll be the last thing, about your will happen on week eight, right? It'll be the Wednesday of week eight. So here is the information. So it's going to be, we're in week six right now. It will be week eight on the Wednesday. So the latest possible time on week eight, the Wednesday. Uh, you're welcome. So that's March 1st, right? We are here. March 1st is here. So two weeks and two days from now. And the topics that are on the midterm are the following, just like everything up through and including week seven. That's uh, that. That's the topics, just like everything we've covered, of course. Uh, most of the points will go towards an essay question. So I'm going to ask you to write an essay. This will all be done on the computers in here. You'll come to the class, type up your essay on Canvas. Uh, it'll be like a Canvas quiz if you, use, if you used that before. So that is the format of the midterm. And in addition to an essay question, there will be other questions about uh, some things I'm about to show you. All right. So here is the idea. So the midterm is going to have a few multiple choice slash short answer questions about other topics, and then an essay, all right? So prepare for this. A short essay on the topics that we've talked about in lecture, on like the non-programming days, and then also some short answer slash multiple choice questions on the topics from this cheat sheet that I've made for you down here. So if I click on this, I want to say right now, I cannot really ask you to write scratch programs on this midterm, right? Because that involves like screenshots or something. I don't even know how I would ask you a Scratch question. So I'm not asking you to write any programs in Scratch. Wink, wink. I'm going to ask you questions based on this cheat sheet. So look through it. Understand these topics. So here are your logical operators. Wink, wink. Uh, here are your logic gates. Wink, wink. Prepare for questions on those things. Okay? That's the idea. Uh, the test, you're allowed to use the cheat sheet on the test. You're, the, the test will be open book and open notes. You just come here, take it, Ask me questions about the questions. You can consult any of the slides, but remember that I'm writing the test under the assumption that you're using your book and your notes. Uh, the one thing you can't do during the test is talk to a human that is not me. Like, don't have Discord open. That's, of course, cheap. Okay? Uh, but you can consult anything that I've made for you before. Totally fine. Or any cheat sheet that you want to write for yourself. Uh, yeah. So are there any questions about the midterm? So it's going to be essay on some like philosophical topics most likely, and then other questions like multiple choice and fill in the blank based on the stuff in this two-page cheat sheet. Does that make enough sense? And that'll be March 1st. You'll come to class, and that'll be all we do for the day. Okay? That will be our midterm, our one and only midterm in the class. Yeah. That is all that I have for us, if there are no other questions.